Great. Thank you so much for, for the introduction. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here um, on this weekend day. I know sometimes we tend to have our thank you slides at the end of our talks, but I really think it's important to acknowledge that none of us do this alone. Um, and I really wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the support of so, so many people. So I really want to give a moment to thank everybody, um, including Sid and Mary, who are sponsoring this, this talk. So thank you very much. And yeah, the lights would be great. Thank you. So John L. Batterson, or Balderson, excuse me, John L. Balderson uh, was at King Tut's discovery on behalf of New York World newspaper. He wrote the screenplay for the 1932 universal film, The Mummy, inspired clearly by Tut's discovery and his tomb's supposed curses. The movie begins with a scene among archeologists talking about the new discovery. And I'll see if this clip works. I didn't test this one. It's okay if it doesn't. Um, that is just fine. Can you put it on the line? I can't see it. Yes, it is. It is. No, we're, we're, we're good. It is alive. We're live. Okay, so in this, in this intro to the very beginning of The Mummy, who has seen The Mummy by chance? Okay, so I don't, I don't need to give you too much background. But in it, we have, you know, these archaeologists who are uncovering this, you know, newfound sort of tomb. Um, there's a mummified remain. There's these great boxes and canopic jars and scrolls and all the good things. And we hear uh, the lead archaeologist, Sir Joseph, um, we hear him say, method is everything in archaeology, my boy. He continues that we don't dig in Egypt for metals. Much more is learned from studying bits of broken pottery than from all the sensational finds. Our job is to increase the sum of human knowledge of the past, not to satisfy our own curiosity. But then speaking of the mummified human recently discovered, they observe that he was buried alive. An inscription reading Imhotep, high priest of the temple of the sun at Karnak, is inscribed on the inside of his coffin. On the opposite side of his coffin are uh, spells that have been chipped away. And they conclude that Imhotep was sentenced to death, not only in this world, but in the next. And so begins the 1932 film, The Mummy, highlighting the incredible legacy of Imhotep during one of the most recent major resurgences of Egyptomania in the United States. Now, before we talk a bit more about Imhotep, I wanted to speak on this term Egyptomania. Egyptomania is the reception, obsession, and appropriation of ancient Egypt and her imagery throughout history. Here you see a local example. This is the shell building in the financial district that has a really beautiful, nice sort of lotus motif in the center of it. And here's a slightly older example um, by quite a bit of time, actually. Uh, this is the Toro Cemetery in Newport, Rhode Island. It was built in the 1620s for the oldest extant Jewish synagogue in Newport. And it evokes Egyptian imagery, especially in its depiction of the winged sun disk on the top lintel there. This was built about 250 years before the discovery of King Tut's tomb and the subsequent Tut Egyptomania that our obsession with ancient Egypt is evident here as a really long-standing tradition. This is not something that simply is a sort of new in fashion thing or something just of the recent past. And indeed, Egyptomania extends as far back as ancient Rome, to whom we are closer to in time than they were to the pyramids of Egypt. So while we think of them as ancient, they clearly thought, the Romans thought of Egypt or early Egypt as ancient in the same way. And so on this map that you see here, we can see the locations of ancient Egyptian obelisks that were brought to Rome, primarily in the first two centuries of the empire. You'll note that there are over a dozen, um, hopefully you can kind of see those yellow pens on the map, take my word for it, there are over a dozen. And that means that there are more in Rome today than there are still standing in Egypt. Rome's first emperor, Augustus, mobilized Egypt as a symbol of his power and consolidated empire. After he captured Egypt, he uh, made these series of coins, Egypto Capta, that you see on the bottom right here, with the crocodile, of course, representing Egypt. And this would have been a way for sort of popular consumption of propaganda, or at least one can argue. And some Hellenistic and Roman rulers of Egypt also guised themselves and their partners in pharaonic clothing and iconography. So on the sort of bottom left, you can see Egyptianized Roman statue 
This is Emperor Hadrian. He's been described as his boyfriend, lover, partner, and tenuous. He drowned in the Nile around 130 CE, and thereafter he was often depicted with Egyptian iconography that was supposed to liken him to Osiris, who according to legend also drowned in the Nile. So Egyptomania may have its origins in ancient Rome, but the phenomenon persists throughout history. Egyptomania scholarship of the recent past, what I refer to as sort of quote unquote traditional Egyptomania scholarship, has outlined well how Europe and the United States primarily have received and celebrated ancient Egypt. But therein also lies the problem. Traditional Egyptomania is largely focused on Western, white, elite, and often even male consumption of ancient Egypt. Nearly all the authors on this topic are men, and nearly all of them are British or American, perhaps expectedly as the colonial ancestors of Egyptian archaeology. Traditional Egyptomania also tends to take a fairly top-down approach, even when considering popular engagement. So rather than focusing, for example, on minority visitors' reactions to or experiences of the King Tut tour in 1976 and 1979, these books talk about the Met and the National Museum director's feud, the movement of objects themselves, the diplomatic negotiation that had to go on for them to arrive in the United States, and the A-listers who attended the events. So for example, in Bob Breyer's um, book you see here, his chapter on Tut talks a lot about folks like Petrie, Carter, Davis, and the Earl of Carnarvon. A few pages are dedicated to the commoditization of Tut mania, his appearance, that meaning his, as in King Tut's appearance in fictional works, such as the 1857's Romance of the Mummy, which in essence predicts the Tut discovery, and 1932's Universal Pictures movie, The Mummy. And that's, again, loosely based on the Tut discovery. Other chapters in Briar look at the reception of ancient Egypt through Western temporal eras and geographic regions, jumping from Rome to Napoleon, France, England, New York, and ancient Egypt and Western cinema. In Fritz's 2006, Egyptomania, a history of fascination, obsession, and fantasy, published by the University of Chicago Press, we see more or less the same trend, the same sort of outline as followed. Here we have chapters on ancient Egypt, the ancient Levant, the biblical tradition, Greco-Roman Egyptomania, European medieval reception, Egyptomania from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment, Napoleon and the birth of so-called modern Egyptomania, 19th century Egyptomania, and the rise of, quote, mass Egyptomania. And so we can see, and I, I'm saying these all out loud because it may be a little difficult for you to read um, on the slide itself, but we can see that these are all sort of framed around Western sort of temporal time periods like the Renaissance and the um, Enlightenment. Part two of the book, which is on the right side of the screen, the table of contents is there, is entitled Varieties of Modern Egyptomania. And here, four chapters discuss Egyptomania and the occult on the fringe of history and fiction and African-American Egyptomania. The inclusion of a discussion of African-American Egyptomania is great to see, but situating it as disparate from quote unquote traditional Egyptomania and placing it alongside the occult fringe history and fiction seems to further ostracize it from the traditional history of the first part of the book. Thank you. I like that there's agreement in the crowd. And so to be clear, I'm not saying that there were no discussions of subaltern groups, marginalized voices, or novel loci, or contexts in these work, or in these works, plural, but it's definitely not the focus. And I argue that these works lack critical engagement with non-Western elite white narratives. Now, elite consumption of ancient Egypt is not all bad by any means. It brings popular attention to ancient Egypt, its histories, artifacts, its peoples. This attention brings support, money, interest in preservation and conservation, tourism, and an ethical investment in ancient Egypt as part of a shared cultural past. But on the other side, that attention is often exoticizing, orientalizing, as in the oriental, orientalizing as in the term Said, right? Um, othering, fantastical, and disconnected from the realities of ancient and contemporary Egypt. Like so many things, it is not intrinsically good or bad, but must be negotiated, balanced, and responsibly contextualized. And so this is where I think I can add something, contribute something novel to the field of Egyptomania and research on reception studies more broadly. 
One of my current research projects, as was mentioned in my intro, um, is this Egyptomania study that uses Imhotep as a lens through which I examine Egyptomania in loci and among communities that are often overlooked in quote unquote traditional studies. This is taking the form of a series of articles and eventually I hope to publish this as a public facing book. And so we can, um, and one second, page out of order. Human error. There we go. So for example, I'm looking at contemporary Egyptian Egyptomania with my colleague, Dr. Fatma Ismail of the American Research Center in Egypt and reception and the use of ancient Egypt within African-American and black communities in the United States. I've also looked at amusement parks and roller coasters and acting social moods. Um, and the topic, uh, the topic on, of amusement parks is actually just, I presented that in August at the International Congress of Egyptologists, and I'll touch on some of that here today. So for today, I want to present a few snapshots of this research. It's very much in its early nascent stages. Uh, specifically though for this presentation, I'll share with you a few examples of reception of ancient Egypt in antiquity and in the contemporary United States. For the cases and antiquity, I hope to show how much there's still to learn about Imhotep and how by using him as a focal point, I uncover aspects of Egyptomania that have otherwise largely gone understudied. For the contemporary US, I hope to show how Imhotep's reception still operates in diverse ways, meaning one thing perhaps with some black and African-American context and communities while meaning something different when evoked at an amusement park. While focusing for now on the United States is obviously not pushing the bounds of this research geographically, I will be looking at a wider range of loci and communities who consume Imhotep than is typically discussed. Furthermore, I may not be breaking the mold too much as a Western white Latina woman. I am dedicated, however, to investigating a more diverse range of narratives and they give space for marginalized voices through collaboration and co-authorship. So the working title of my next Egyptomania project is Imhotep, the man, the myth, the monster. And many of us in, in the US specifically will recognize Imhotep as the monster, here portrayed by Boris Karloff on the left and Arnold Vasilou on the right. And I say in the United States, in the US, because when I ask my Egyptian colleagues about Imhotep, they actually don't recall his reference from films. They know of his, him as a historical figure, but they're not as familiar with this sort of monster motif of Imhotep because those films are really not very popular in Egypt. And my friend um, Fatma Ismail, who's working on a project on Egyptian Egyptomania, so contemporary Egyptian Egyptomania, she was interviewing a number of folks and she was asking them about Imhotep because she knew I was interested in, in that sort of aspect of it. And so almost everybody she interviewed did not know who Imhotep was except for his historical connection. You know, people were like, oh, he's like the guy who built the pyramids. You know, that's kind of what they remembered. There's one individual though who definitely knew about him and his sort of later iterations, his later legacy. Um, and so I wanna show you a short clip of that interview right now. Uh, في التاريخ عمل هرم زوسا هرم مدرج ومن كتر ما كان راجل علامة عملوا إله وأصبح إله من الآلهة المصرية القديمة طبعا إمحطب حاجة عظيمة جدا طب تعرف حاجة من إمحطب شخصية من شخصياته اللي تورد في الأفلام لا 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 لا, لا, لا. الأفلام بقى اللي بتبين المصريين القدماء بالطريقة دي بتاعت the mummy والحاجات دي كلها ده ده حاجة يعني بترخص من قيمة حاجة كبيرة جدا وبتخليها حاجة commercial وهي مش حاجة تجارية هي حاجة دي حضارة الحضارة المصرية لازم تبقى الناس تعرف عنها تتعلم عنها وتحس انه الحضارة دي حضارة ما هيش fiction ما هيش fantasy ما هيش حاجة مش حقيقية ما هيش قصص وخيالات وأساطير لا دي حاجة كانت موجودة الحاجات اللي زي الأفلام دي بتخلي البني آدم أو الأطفال أو الناس اللي ما رجعتش مصر تفتكر إنه المصريين القدماء دول 
مش موجودين انها كلها اساطير وحكايات عنهم وهم ما كانوش عايشين لا كانوا عايشين ودي حضاره بجد وقصصهم قصص حقيقيه بجد So we can really tell that the mummy and the Imhotep motif are not particularly valued um, at least by those in Egypt who are aware of it um, and so again this was the only person she spoke to who even sort of really had a frame of reference for the Imhotep movies um, and I love his just like no 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 <laughs> la 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 like it's just like he's not a big fan right and for good reason and that will sort of get into a little bit um, as we keep talking through this and so because of that though I originally had wanted to do this project and include contemporary Egyptians reviews on this but I found that it that really didn't work because there wasn't that same sort of narrative of Imhotep in contemporary Egypt so I am for now sort of focusing on the United States at least for this sort of moment in my research But I realize I just critiqued that, so I understand. <laughs> um, but I am doing that for an intentional reason right now. And so Imhotep, um, I know many of you in this room probably already know, was a real historical figure. He was deified in antiquity by the Egyptian New Kingdom around 1200 BCE. Um, I think though much earlier actually, but that's for sure um, when we know he was deified by. And through this apotheosis, through this deification, he's assimilated with the other gods of the Egyptian pantheon. In Greco-Roman Egypt, his unique status continues and his myth propagates throughout history up to today, where he becomes a proxy for ancient Egypt and ancient Africa. We have limited evidence, however, despite the fact that we know he was a real historical figure, we really only have two pieces of evidence that are contemporary to him, to his life and death, and that explicitly evoke him, his titles, and his name. So I'll caveat that and put a little asterisk next to it because we have a whole bunch of other artifacts that mention very similar titles, if not the exact same collection of titles, but don't have the name Imhotep, but date to the same time. So those are likely Imhoteps, but I can't, you know, with 100% certainty say so. Um, but I certainly argue that these likely do belong to him in my larger sort of article and research. But for now, these are the two pieces that have the name Imhotep on them. The first is the statue base. Um, and the second is a Depento, an inked inscription. So the statue base is presumably, everybody quotes it as being of King Djoser, um, the king of the third dynasty for whom Imhotep was the architect of the first pyramid for Djoser's um, burial. But I think there's a possibility this was actually of Imhotep himself, but that's for another talk. Um, but along the base of the statue, whomever it belonged to, there's a list of Imhotep's titles and his name. Um, and so on the left side, we can see, see Imhotep written, and then all of the sort of stuff, the glyphs around are different titles for him. In the middle then, sort of of the, of the base, you can see the Serac. For those who don't know, the Serac is this rectangular, simple representation of an important building um, that dates to this era that would encircle the king's name, um, in essence, sort of illustrating who is in the like literal physical seat of power, sort of earlier version of what later the cartouche kind of does, a way of marking the king's name. To the right of this Serac, um, we see the term king, beat, followed by two signs that read Senui, or the two brothers. This could possibly indicate that Imhotep was a childhood companion of the king, was the sort of brother of the king, so to say, um, or some sort of royal alter ego, it has been suggested as well. And the second contemporaneous evidence for Imhotep is uh, this Depento. And this is an inked inscription, as I said. It was found upon the northern enclosure wall of the mortuary complex of Djoser's successor, Sekhemhet. And Chris Naughton interprets this um, as him having been served under Djoser and Sekhemhet. It lists the title um, of seal bearer of the king, um, and we think so at least because you can tell it's pretty poorly preserved. The preservation is not great, um, but I think, I think we can make it out enough to um, interpret it as such. And this is where I think infrared photography would be really great. As far as I don't know, no infrared photography has been done of this. Um, so if anybody you know, has a couple hundred thousand dollars, they want to buy me infrared you know, photography setup, just fly me out to Egypt, I'll get you some good images. Um, just throwing that out there. But I'll continue to say that the um, exact process by which a man in ancient Egypt became a god is outlined in my book. Death, power, and apotheosis in ancient Egypt, the old and middle kingdoms. But Imhotep is not in here because we don't have super clear evidence of him being deified until the new kingdom, 
So he's actually not included in my case study for this first book, which is why this sort of project now is sort of growing out of that. And I'm exploring some different things with Imhotep. But don't read this expecting to find out where Imhotep's tomb is. Um, I won't elaborate on the details of this whole process, but I will say that Imhotep was deified according to the criteria that I developed in, in this book. And he was deified by the reign of Ramses II of the New Kingdom, the 19th dynasty, and that's about 1200 BCE. This is the earliest clear evidence, more sort of certain evidence, but I do believe he was deified probably already in the Middle Kingdom. So that's around 2300 BCE. In either case, though, his deification then occurred some 500 or 1500 years after his life and death. His cult only grew in popularity in the late Ptolemaic and Roman eras and continued at least into the third century CE. So here's the basin that dates the reign of Ramses II in which Imhotep is deified. Um, and so in my, my breakdown of Imhotep, the man, the myth, and the monster, this is how we move from man to myth, right? This is him and his deified form becoming a sort of ancient myth, a legend. Um, he's identified here as a great one, son of Ta, and he is also included as an element of the traditional Ptah, Sokar, Osiris triad. So this is a sort of syncretized deity, these three gods that sort of work together um, in unison as Ptah, Sokar, Osiris. Here he's evoked as Sokar, Osiris, Imhotep, the great son of Ptah. And I think because he is maybe not quite as important or powerful as the other deities, he sort of takes the latter position, which is a sort of subordinate position where Ptah normally would show up first in that order of deities. But this is just sort of some of the, some of the evidence that we have for his deification. Um, and again, his cult just explodes in the late Greek and Roman eras. Um, this is just an example to show how many monuments um, or rather um, artifacts we have dedicated to him. These are statues, um, roughly like the size of a, like a Kleenex box, you know, something like a water bottle Kleenex box, usually on average. Um, so maybe about a foot, a little bit shorter. And so these are fairly portable. Um, and we have dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of these in museums all across the world. Almost all of them date to this late and Greco-Roman Hellenistic era. Finally, Imhotep, or Imutes, is also assimilated with the Greek hero god Asclepius, whose snake-twined rod is emblematic of healing and medicine even to this day. Imhotep Asclepius joined the main cast of characters alongside Hermes Trismegistus, Amun, and Thoth of a late antique and medieval collection of works known as the Corpus Hermeticum, or the Hermetica. Though much of the Hermetica was written in the second or third century CE, our current translations of the Corpus, usually defines the set of 17 Greek treaties, are largely based on about 28 medieval manuscript copies. Those date from the 14th to 17th centuries. Imhotep's involvement in the Hermetica is almost completely overlooked in the major works on this topic. And the foundational work, for example, by Yates on Bruno and the Corpus Hermetica, she makes no mention of Imhotep in the entire book. In addition to assimilating with Asclepius, Imhotep is also associated with Hermes Trismegistus, Hermes Thoth Thrice Great, a point that's again often overlooked in the current scholarship. Imhotep's kinship to Ptah often takes sort of the major sort of focus of scholarship, and his kinship to Thoth is often not discussed as much. I presented on this aspect of Imhotep's identity previously, so again, I won't go into it in detail here, but I'm happy to talk more about it if you have questions. But this just goes to show that where we see ground previously covered already, such as chapters in Breyer's Rome and the Birth of Egyptian, uh, Rome and the Birth of Egyptomania, or in Fritz's quote medieval Egyptomania from St. Augustine to the Renaissance, much has been overlooked. Using Imhotep as a focal point has thus allowed me to uncover and shine a light on otherwise understudied aspects within the scholarship of reception studies of ancient Egypt. And in looking at Imhotep and the contemporary United States, I hope to show how his consumption were for different communities within different contexts. Too often we presume a monolithic reception by a particular nation or time period. In a very generalized sense, Imhotep became a proxy for both ancient Egypt and ancient Africa within different contexts. 
Within some Black and African American contexts, we see Imhotep as a stand-in for a pan-African glorious past, whereas Imhotep in his mummified form was often mobilized as a proxy for a very particular orientalized iteration of ancient Egypt, such as we see in film or in amusement parks. So for example, the chosen name of David C. Jones, an author who I don't agree with, but has a chosen name of David Imhotep. Imhotep is also um, invoked um, in um, images, or sorry, um, Imhotep um, journal at San Francisco State University was or is, I haven't seen a publication since I think 2019, so I'm not sure if it's still going on, um, but was or is the student journal for Africana studies. And at Kansas State University, the Imhotep initiative seeks to increase black male student success and retention. And so in these instances, um, especially within the academy, perhaps because of Imhotep's connection to sort of wisdom and sort of knowledge more broadly, he's invoked particularly within the academy. But in these instances, Imhotep's name evokes images of an African American black lived experience and identity tied to an ancient African past rather than ancient Egypt explicitly or exclusively. Now, while some products of Egyptomania can act as a stand-in, as I said, for an African, an ancient African sort of past, um, Imhotep can also um, show up in, in ancient Egypt, more generally can show up, in, sorry, excuse me, Egyptomania motifs can show up in ways that are tied specifically to ancient Egypt as well. Um, so it's not though in every instance we see it's a sort of this broader sort of ancient Africa. Um, here just are a couple examples of musical examples, Beyonce, um, anybody in this room probably knows about Sun Ra because of Rita's work on Sun Ra, Nas, and all of these folks make explicit reference to ancient Egypt and not just a sort of gen more generic ancient Africa. Okay, so um, we then move on to amusement parks. And this is the sort of final point I want to make or the final sort of area I want to look at. Um, and again, we can't assume a single mode of reception for one region or nation or one community in time or place. And so I really want to show just some of the diversity of reception. Whereas Imhotep has been mobilized as a proxy, as I said, for ancient Africa, or used as a touch point for some Black and African Americans, Imhotep in other contexts can carry different meanings. And so notably in the context of the amusement park, Imhotep in his mummified form evokes ancient Egypt explicitly, but a particular popular iteration of ancient Egypt intertwined with Orientalism, which creates an embodied experience that is exoticizing and othering. So there are three mummy rides, um, two in the United States. Of those two in the United States, one is in Universal Studios Orlando, and the other is at Universal Studios Hollywood. The rides are based on the 1999 film franchise, and Brendan Fraser actually stars in the pre-show of the one in Orlando. Despite the uh, similar theming, both rides are actually quite different. Um, in its official description on the Universal Studios website for the Orlando ride, it reads, quote, digging your nails into the safety rail, you'll hold on tight, fleeing from the evil mummy Imhotep. So it's explicit that it is Imhotep. Um, now, as far as I can remember, and I've ridden that ride a few times for research, um, <laughs> actually, yeah. Um, I've read it like seven times in one day, but um, <laughs> there is no explicit mention to Imhotep during the ride, as far as I can tell, or as I picked up on, um, but definitely the website makes it explicit that it is Imhotep um, in the ride. And certainly based on that movie, it's Imhotep. That's the name of the evil, vengeful mummy from the movie. But um, just in case you haven't been on it as many times as I have, I'll walk you through some of it and show you a couple of images so you get a feel for what this ride, what this ride is like. As you walk up to the ride, you are often confronted by a pharaoh on stilts. He's usually shirtless, wearing a Nemi's headdress, and he looms over visitors, often reaching out threateningly. Um, I argue his inhumane height adds a sense of othering that is vaguely threatening. You then enter into a film set, and this is the Orlando version, which is different. So here it's a film set where they are filming a mummy movie. The pre-show, which you can see, so you can see it's like a, it's a film, right? So there's gonna be a rap party, but it's W-R-A-P, because of mummies, it's funny, right? Um, nice, nice and fun puns. 
Um, and then, so there's a video that you see here, that's sort of the pre-show video. Um, I won't show it to you just for technology's sake, um, but I can link it or show it to you later another time. But you probably can't read what it actually says up there, um, but it is the director of the film saying, um, let me find the quote here. It's interesting. Almost all of the locals we hired as extras were really leery about getting near the artifacts. So it creates the sense of, you know, this film set that goes to this exotic land, hires locals who have this strange superstition and won't want to go near these artifacts. Um, nothing wrong can happen there. And so then you enter a temple that is uh, part of the, the filming, and there's a large statue of Anubis that has fallen over. Um, and you can see him sort of here on the bottom right of the screen. Then ancient Egyptian royal scenes from temples and tombs are carved along the walls. You walk through the line, which has these scenes, and then you reach the ride vehicles that are called mine carts. And then this part comes from, um, I'm taking a lot of big chunks from the website here throughout. So after boarding the mine carts and taking off into the tomb, you're greeted by Reggie. And Reggie is the only person on the film team who wasn't a local who was saying like, hey, maybe we shouldn't be doing this, you guys. And it turns out he's, um, his earlier concerns were, were valid because he's since been mummified and he's trying to stop you from going into further into the tomb. Um, and he wants to make sure it doesn't happen to anyone else, but it's too late. The website says, Imhotep has taken over the tour. And so you're taken through a room filled with ancient treasures where Imhotep will try to win you over with riches. But before you can decide, mummy soldiers appear on all sides as Imhotep utters an Egyptian curse. And then fire used to race across the ceiling. Um, I know, don't think they, any, they seem to not be doing that anymore. Um, and air guns puff at your lower legs to mimic the scarab beetles that are crawling over you to eat you. I'm crawling over you to eat you because that's what they do in the movie, not because that's what they do in real life. <laughs> so just to clarify that I know the difference. Um, and so there is a lot of sort of multi-sensory experiences that are going on um, in this ride. So there's the heat of the fire, there's the air puffs, you're moving through you know, the space really quickly. So it really is a sort of holistic, sort of all engaging experience that really hits your senses on multiple levels. Of course, then you exit through the gift shop. And this gift shop is called Sahara Traders. Um, and the website explains that before you leave, you should grab, quote, grab something with a Medjay symbol on it to protect you in the future. So here we have a lot of interesting sort of, it sums up, it's actually really interesting. So there is a desk, like an archaeology desk that has all these like letters that are written out. Um, it's specifically, it's kind of funny. It's a, it's an archaeologist writing to his sponsor asking for more money, <laughs> which felt like, I felt very seen, right? Um, and then, but there's other things that are just like, cats, you know, and Nemi's headdresses. Um, there is, a, you know, the wonders of the world. And then there's, of course, this like mummified um, sort of human mummy in, in a sarcophagus. But there's also, and I don't have all the images on here, but it's kind of, the gift shop is also kind of problematic because it also shows images of, you know, Frankenstein's monster and the creature of the Black Lagoon, like right, because all the classics are horror creatures and monsters alongside each other. So there really is this sort of complicated blending between this sort of ancient Egyptian motif and just sort of like horror broadly defined, which I find potentially a bit problematic. Now, the second to open, so the first ride to open was in Orlando, and the second to open was in Hollywood about a week later. And then this was followed a little bit, quite a bit later by a third ride in Singapore, which I have not been on. But again, if you want to sponsor a research trip. Um, I will do the hard work that needs to be done for this project. And so in Hollywood, you are transported to 1926 with archeologists who are entering the tomb of Imhotep. And so those of you who thought that the tomb of Imhotep had not been discovered, you're wrong, it's in Hollywood. Um, and you can enter it and see it. And there are curses that cover the walls. And quote, again from the website, an awakening Imhotep mummy informs writers that your souls are mine and then water drips on you um, as you sort of enter into the ride, and then you shoot off into the underworld and this fast, dark, fun roller coaster. And so again, this one has the air, the puffs on your legs at the ends, there's water that drips on you as like these ghouls kind of reach out for you. So again, a lot of sort of sensory experiences throughout, throughout the ride. Now, the context of the amusement park is not irrelevant. 
Anderson and his research has shown that roller coasters are, quote, the ultimate representation of American amusement. Furthermore, research on immersive learning environments, such as the yurt you see here that I projected, um, a 3D model of an Egyptian temple I worked on a public VR. Um, this was years ago at Brown University when I was a graduate student, but we projected it into what's called the yurt, which is this immersive system that allows you to sort of walk through the Egyptian temple with 3D um, glasses on. And because it's projected around you, it really sort of feels like you're moving within the space. And so this sort of um, immersive learning environments have been shown, um, have shown that embodied and immersive spaces foster greater learning. Um, so learning in a space like this is going to be um, more impactful than learning in a space like we are right now. If I was doing this lecture on the mummy ride, I promise you, you would remember it. <laughs> um, 10 years from now, you'd be like, there's that one lecture, it was on the ride. And so that sort of full bodied embodied experience really helps us recall information. And so while fantastical by its very nature, I think roller coasters actually create opportunities for really deep learning. What then do people learn when they ride the mummy? To answer this, I conducted a very scientific study. Um, I asked my friends who are with me in Orlando and who are riding the mummy for the first time. I asked them what terms or ideas come to mind immediately after riding the ride. And these are just like three people. <laughs> so again, not a full scientific study, very anecdotal, but it's something, right? And so they said, after getting off the ride, we were in Sahara Traders, so they weren't even out of the gift shop yet. And I said, what words come to mind? What concepts? And they said, curses, fake, death, skeletal, mummies, fire, and scarabs. Now, does this mean then that ancient Egypt becomes fake for them or only associated with curses and mummified remains? Probably not. They are well-educated adults who are friends with an Egyptologist. And so, and many of them actually been to Egypt before. Um, so it's not as though riding this ride is going to then just all of a sudden make you believe that the ride is real. But it certainly paints a particular picture that I argue is informed by a long history of exoticizing ancient Egypt in the United States. Um, and perhaps, if not most notably, through the vehicle of Imhotep. And I think if this becomes the only place in which you are experiencing Imhotep, that then may potentially have, this is the first way you learn about Egypt or Imhotep. This is the first way you learn about ancient Egypt and the only way or your only experience with ancient Egypt, then it may have a sort of different impact than it has on my, my friends who are, you know, Berkeley lawyers, right? And know me. Um, so to summarize, um, at amusement parks, Imhotep and the mummy motif evoke an imagined orientalizing ancient Egypt. But overall, hopefully I have shown that a focused study of Imhotep and varied historical contexts provides novel insights into the phenomenon of Egyptomania and contributes to a more inclusive discussion of Egyptomania. One that moving forward should include, for example, contemporary Egyptian consumption of ancient Egypt and other understudied loci such as amusement parks and other communities as well.